a very warm welcome to all of you. Today, um, we will explore ways to maximize preparation and support for the adoption and adjustment to the changes, to the revolutionary changes brought about by emerging AI technologies while uh, you know, exploring ways to minimize the threats resulting from the resistance that we usually have to new technologies and our latent incapacity at times to seize those opportunities. So we have a very exciting panel lined up for you. First, let me introduce myself. I am Ranjani Ravi, Associate Editor of Cadmus Journal, a transdisciplinary journal of the World Academy of Art and Science. Cadmus is dedicated to fresh thinking and new perspectives that integrate knowledge from all fields of science, art, humanities to address real life challenges you know, and issues, inform policy and decision making and uh, enhance our collective response to global challenges and opportunities. I am also an associate fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science and senior research analyst at the Mother's Service Society, an educational research institute based in Pondicherry, India. So um, when WAS was founded in 1960, it began as this agency for human welfare. And the tradition still continues to this day. The WAS project Human Security for All is a unifying theme, an all comprehensive integrated approach, what we call an umbrella term that encompasses all aspects of human and societal well being. The project stresses the importance of addressing societal implications of emerging technologies as well, such as AI. So, artificial intelligence, we believe, has the potential to be this transformative force in the realm of human security and achieving the SDGs on time. This panel will move towards a narrow view of AI as a standalone technology. Instead, we will explore its multifaceted role within a holistic approach centered on human well-being. So let me introduce our distinguished panelists now. Dr. Liang Ji Zhang is a pioneering AI and digital transformation expert. He's distinguished professor at the College of Computer Science and Software Engineering and the director of the Center for AI Services Computing at Zhenzhen University, China. He's an IEEE fellow with extensive industry experience, having served as chief technology officer at King D International Software Group listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and Chief Architect of Industrial Standards at IBM. As for Stacey Lawson, she is the Vice Chairman of Y Green Energy Fund, an innovative clean energy finance company which was deployed, uh, which has deployed over $2 billion in renewable energy, energy efficiency and climate resiliency projects. Prior to leading Y Green, Stacey was a candidate for US Congress in California's second congressional district where she advocated for critical economic, environmental and societal initiatives. She is a change maker and a conscious leader. Her most recent passion project, the Human Evolution Project aims to bridge ancient science with modern technology to foster a transformative community dedicated to the upliftment of humanity. Anika Rao or Anika Rao Monari is a youth leader, an AI and blockchain entrepreneur, the founder of CLE AI, an AI research tool that understands the human context to deliver instant, highly accurate and fully trustworthy responses. A former physicist, Anika has been recognized by Forbes as one of the 30 under 30 notable young people who can make a difference in the world. So I would request our panelists here to be fairly brief so we can keep the momentum going. Thank you and let us begin. Um, let me address the first question to Dr. Jan here. So given your extensive experience in both academia and industry, 
what do you see as the most significant barrier to the widespread adoption of AI technologies, specifically in AI, uh, you know, educational institutions, and how can we overcome them? Dr. Jan, please. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, you know the introduction. So I'm quickly share with you, uh, uh, you know, how AI shapes the future of education and research. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, it's a privilege to be here today to discuss the impact of AI on education and research. As we stand on the brink of major technological uh, advancement, AI's integration into education and research is very, very important. Today, I will explore how AI is enhancing traditional methods and paving the, the way for new approaches. Uh, the first uh, you know, item I want to share with you is uh, personalized learning through AI. Let's begin with education. One of the biggest uh, contributions of AI is personalized learning, which tailors educational experience to meet individual students' needs. Concept adaptive learning platform like Discovery Educational Dream Box Math, which modify contents in real time to suit the learner's pace and style. This AI-driven approach ensures that no student is left behind, adapting to changes such as learning difficulties or faster learners. Additionally, AI extends to virtual tutors and assistants, providing students with on-demand academic support. Tools like ChatGPT offer hands-on experience, learning experience that was you know, very important in classroom. For instance, I have used ChatGPT to add more supporting materials for my course, computer ethics, and prepare multiple choice exams for in-class use. ChatGPT provides instant feedback and explanations, making learning more interactive and personalized. So these examples show how AI supports and enhances personalized learning. The second item I want to share with you is AI in academic research. Moving into the research, AI is changing how we gather, analyze, and understand uh, vast amounts of data in fields like uh, uh, the mathematical, gen general metrics, AI algorithms can process huge data sets to find patterns that would take human hours to analyze you know, for years. This capability is crucial for breakthrough like personalized medicine. For example, it has the ability uh, to model complex systems have transformed scientific exp exper uh, experiments. For example, uh, climate scientists using AI to predict weather patterns, weather patterns, and model climate change with greater accuracy than ever before. Like tools, uh, for example, ChatGPT can assist researchers by quickly summarizing large amounts of scientific literature, like papers. So we can easily to use ChatGPT to identify key research trends and generate some new ideas. When I extended you know, the computing technologies from personalized uh, personal computers to cloud computing, all the pricing models, ecosystems, and ethics uh, have changed. So I used ChatGPT to introduce the latest cloud computing technologies and the ethical considerations in, to my uh, students. So additionally, during the, my research, I use AI to detect fake contents in AI-generated content, AIGC. 
So you can say we can use lots of large language models with expertise in uh, deep fake detection. So AI can be really used to enhance our research experience. The last point I want to make is, uh, you know, the, we can use AI to pioneer new academic frontiers. AI is not just is is not just the enhancing existing practices; it's pioneering entirely new frontiers in academia. So, like lots of cross-discipline research, especially in the intersection of AI and other disciplines. We can use AI to provide insights into how human cognitions and the learning process can be used to model the AI ecosystem and also to help us uh, you know, uh, to uh, uh, discover uh, what's the you know, major component of an AI system in the future. So AI-powered tools like ChatGPT can really uh, facilitate uh, those innovations by providing real-time data analytics and enhancing collaborative research efforts. So those, in, uh, those in initiatives are just the beginning of uh, you know, using AI to explore new research directions. So to recap, AI enhances personalized learning empowers researchers and scientists to handle complex data to pioneer new academic uh, research directions. So I urge all stakeholders in education and research to embrace this AI-driven innovations. The future is here and it is filled with endless possibilities. Thank you uh, for your in, uh, attention. I look forward to seeing how each of you will continue to this exciting innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much for your insights. We'll come back to you in a bit. So I'm moving over to Stacy now. So given the rapid advancement of AI and its integration into daily life, we need an AI, I think. It's not just me, it's the entire world that incorporates values from wisdom literature, including religious, spiritual, philosophical texts. Is such a wisdom AI being built? Why do you think it matters, especially for youth? Hmm. Well, first, let me thank you for being on the panel. I appreciate the opportunity to join you for this important conversation. And the, the sort of the lens I'm looking through is, is one um, that's related to the Benevolent AI Coalition that I recently co-founded that's focusing on largely on wisdom AI, as you mentioned, bringing together builders and funders to both look at how we, how we use AI to elevate human consciousness, but also how we can envision, design, and build more conscious and wise AI. Um, so first, let me sort of address your question of um, you know, is this being built? Why is it important? Um, I would say if we just go back to first principles, right, the ultimate goal of artificial intelligence, I would argue, is to develop technology that serves humanity, right? That that in all cases improves our capacity to perform, to create, to innovate, to flourish. And yet, if, you know, I think we would all agree that intelligence alone, like just simply our cognitive abilities to reason and problem solve, right, does not and has not guaranteed the well-being of either individuals or societies. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition, right? It is not intelligence, but rather wisdom that is associated with things like greater well-being, thriving, happiness, um, health, even, even the longevity of the species, right? And so the target for our technology need really be artificial wisdom or you know wisdom ai instead of just artificial intelligence and i think that wisdom can also serve to mitigate the risks of agi and super ai um so then the question becomes what is wisdom and how do we build it into ai 
And really, it's it's interesting that, of course, wisdom has been addressed in our religious and philosophical context for millennia. But in terms of like the Western scientific model of studying wisdom, it's really only been the last 50 years or so, um, starting kind of in the 1970s, where we started looking at the components of wisdom. And that that sort of helps us understand what might be built into AI. So there's not one single definition of wisdom, but I wanted to share some of the pieces that it includes. Um, so things like pro-social attitudes and behaviors. So things like empathy and compassion and lo loving kindness, um, altruism, things like moral reasoning, um, emotional regulation, which, you know, does that apply to AI or not, right? Diversity of perspective. So this ability to value relativism and um, tolerate a plurality of of ideas and viewpoints, things like ethical decision making, dealing with uncertainty, like you know, weighing and balancing decisiveness with ambiguity. How how do we act in in that regard? Um, capacity capacity for self reflection, for self understanding. So these things are you know these these become the primary questions I believe we should be looking at as a society, which is how do we train, test, evaluate. AI on these wisdom principles. And so I don't believe that's being done widely now. Um, in my conversations with the LLM kind of foundational models and big tech, it's not a, it's not a high priority at this point. We've really looked more at how to do no harm. Right? And so the benevolent AI coalition is basically convening individuals from those industry perspectives to come together to develop open source uh, frameworks, data sets, training, and evals that can be offered, you know, in a as industry resources into the collective field, into the common, so to speak, that provide these resources for LLM training on Wisdom AI, so that we can we can start to build um, models that actually incorporate more of that best practice of collective human wisdom. Um, and I would just, as a side note, say I welcome anyone on the call today who's interested and knowledgeable in these areas to join us in that. Um, that's wonderful. You've given us a lot of, um, you know, you've made us question the fundamentals of how the whole thing works. And um, I'll, I'll get back to you soon, uh, Stacey, with, with another question that has been running behind my mind. So anyway, um, Anika. Um, given the impressive advancements in AI-powered search engines, where do you see the limitations of current search paradigms? So how can AI search engines leverage their unique capacities to address these shortcomings and fundamentally transform the way users interact with information discovery? Thanks. Um, thanks also for having me. Um, I really wanted to say, uh, Stacey, it's very interesting um, what you're what you're talking about. Um, in, in fact, um, we are um, busy looking at different models for how do you go from a kind of supervised learning model um, to a more kind of self learning conscious model with all of these different layers that reflect how experience affects wisdom, which then affects. Um, you know, some core instincts that you might have as a, as a human and then kind of, you know, um, spits it all back out again and, you know, starts defining this model. Um, so it's, it's really interesting that you're doing that. I'd love to be um, a part of, um, part of what you're doing. Um, so I just wanted to say that first. Um, it does uh, tie back. Um, thank you very much for um, the question. It, um, it's interesting. My answer does actually tie back to what both um, uh, uh, Stacy um, um, and uh, I. I think essentially um, the way that search engines today uh, classify and um, evaluate the kind of quality of information is overweighted towards syntactic as such like structural kind of um, attributes of the information in other words um, if you're looking at the how well structured a web page is whether they're using different tags and things like this um, you know uh, if they have information that's kind of put together in a particular way um, 
you know, often that actually requires a lot of funding to do right. And it requires you working with the right people to do right. Um, and it doesn't account for the kind of semantic quality of the information that's being uh, put forward. And um, AI search engines, I think they have the ability to evaluate the semantic quality and uh, put forward different features of information that are related to, for example, um, the you know validity of the information. Um, so in other words, is it an opinion or is it, you know, is it something that's more true? Um, and it also uh, has the ability to evaluate the completeness of the information and its relevance um, to like a certain point, right? Um, rather than it, you know, mentioning the point, um, you know, it is is the overall theme and, um, you know, point that the information is conveying. Is that actually related to the original point, or is it just side information? Um, that ultimately prevents you and i don't know about you but i've i've spent hours on google like looking through all the links clicking on all of them going through <laughs> looking to see if it was the right information or not and it wasn't you know um so you know um ai search engines have the ability to uh kind of combat this i also think based on what stacy is saying they have an ability to also evaluate different features to do with things like emotional um, information about, um, you know, maybe the opinion that someone's writing or, you know, yeah, uh, like the prediction of, of some events. So there's a lot of interesting things that you can do. And, uh, you know, hopefully you will not have to scroll through 10 pages of Google to get your answer. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> um, uh, I, I like your honesty, <laughs> Anika. And I... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, I think we'll have time for one more set of, um, you know, questions and, um, right. So anyway, we'll start with uh, Dr. Zhang again. With your background in leading uh, academic research and in industrial projects, uh, can you share some successful examples of AI applications in industry? that could be adapted for use in educational settings? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ronika. Um, I think one uh, successful example is using AI for predictive analytics in customer service to personalize the user experiences because in the customer support, we need an uh, AI assistant to help, uh, you know, take some questions and answer automatically. So this kind of uh, AI solutions can be adapted in education to predict student performance and provide personalized learning pathways. Another example, AI, uh, another example is AI-driven uh, chatbots used in customer support, which can be used as a virtual tutors or teaching assistants in our educational settings, especially when I you know, use the uh, large language model with the rack uh, to create my localized large language models to support uh, my teaching, you know, my course, like a computer ethics. Uh, that can be easily used in class. So this kind of uh, uh, AI-driven solutions can be used in multiple industries or in multiple uh, industry settings, like the uh, you know customer support uh, technologies can be used in educational settings or even in other uh, you know AI-driven uh, scenarios. This is my take. Okay, thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you. Thanks for the succinct answer. So, Stacy, back to you. How can we intentionally and consciously design and implement AI systems to promote human well-being? Specifically, what measures can be taken to ensure that AI applications prioritize mental health and the overall quality of life? Mm, interesting. Okay, so... Um... I would say that 
mostly thus far, right? We've been kind of stuck in this era where we're the paradigm is around doing no harm, right? That's the kind of target function. And, you know, of course, we don't want AI to do things like commit crimes or recruit children into human trafficking or deceive or offend people. Um, and, and rightly so, but that's been a fairly low bar, right? A friend of mine who is uh, runs AI products at one of the big tech companies recently described our current large language models as basically eight to 12 year olds, you know, basically, you know, be polite and don't make a mess of things. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the primary focus thus far has been on cutting the left tail of the bell curve to avoid the bad stuff, which we all hear about. And we've all heard, you know, doomsday scenarios and so forth. It has not been so much about ensuring or amplifying the right tail of the curve or or moving the sort of full distribution to the right, right, to with an explicit um, focus on human flourishing. And I believe that's been a, a market failure. Now, to be fair, um, you know, AI researchers and engineers are math and technology geniuses, not philosophers, ethicists, social scientists. And they're hired to build technically, you know, impressive things, not to worry about humanistic values. Um, so let me give you an example of where this could be shifted, right? So in AI, we have this concept of alignment, which you've probably heard about. It's an attempt to train the large language models on human preferences around ethical behavior. Now, um, so the AI research teams will write up guidelines for RLHF, reinforcement learning through human feedback, which is this iterative process where humans interact with the AI to, to train it on human preference. And yet they hand over those guidelines to contractors to perform the alignment, right? So it kind of begs the question, alignment with what kind of human, right? How conscious a human? And so the empirical answer to that is, according to researchers at UC Davis, if you run the large foundational models through a stages of consciousness framework, right, the LLM score roughly the same as the average human. Right? which, you know, in a certain way isn't surprising this makes sense because the pre-training data is the average of the internet, right? It's Reddit and Twitter and TikTok and a, and a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of a lower expression of human consciousness. Now, the post-training models are a little bit better, but certainly not in a category that we'd call wise, right? So this is both a market failure and a huge opportunity, I believe, right? That that we can advance AI with humanistic values. Imagine in, instead AI trained on the accumulated knowledge of the world's great wisdom traditions. And imagine that engaging, you know, engaging wisdom keepers and trauma therapists, social scientists, psychologists, neuroscientists, all in this alignment and training work. Like it's it's both embedding um appropriate data set and data set annotations in the models, but it's also around how we train and evaluate, how we're hitting these benchmarks that I mentioned earlier of wisdom um, of wisdom measures. And I would say, I'll close with this, that I think for the next one to three years, as the industry focuses mostly on individual human level agents, so not AGI or super AI, that this miss on the wisdom front is an unfortunate miss, but not like an enormous problem. But in the next three to five years, as we start to see more and more distributed agents, so collective societies of agents moving around the web, specializing and cooperating agent to agent, where we have less view from a human perspective into what and how they're working, that this piece, these pieces around wisdom, both the the wisdom metrics and as well as the training and evaluation of the models associated with wisdom metrics, right, will become a much, much more important topic. Thank you so much. Now over to Anika. Um, see, the future demands that we be adaptable, emotionally intelligent individuals uh, who can lead with purpose, right? Um, this needs a shift in our collective perspective and perception. So as a collective, we usually see, you know, any new technology for that matter. We've been seeing AI as a threat for the most part. You know, for example, leaving people behind without uh, a job safety net, for instance. 
So what proactive steps do you think we can take to harness the potential of AI while mitigating potential risks and threats? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, it's actually an interesting an interesting question because obviously I've worked with enterprises before trying to implement, you know, different AI strategies and and help with, you know, a kind of um, advancement, um, you know, in, in essence of different processes and things. And it's such a difficult one because obviously you have to learn about the processes. So you have to kind of go down onto the floor and speak to the people doing the different things. <laughs> and basically you're there talking to them ultimately, you know, in some sense to replace them or replace parts of what they do. Uh, and, you know, they kind of know that and you kind of know that. And it's this unspoken sort of awkward thing in the middle. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think that that's really one of the, one of the problems um, that, you know, it's like, um, um, you know, under, under development, you know, like people's skills obviously have to change and adapt um, as certain, you know, processes kind of um, come to fruition with an AI replacing it or, or what have you. Um, but I actually think there's a different opportunity, um, you know, with AI um, to, to kind of help um, humans without replacing them, but actually empowering them. Um, I, was, I was thinking a lot, looking at all the elections and things going on. And, you know, the topics that are covered for the most part are very unrelatable to the regular human. Um, certainly myself, you know, it's, it's talking about certain like, you know, um, social policies and and economic policies that you know are, are quite technical, and I don't I don't understand fully how it affects my daily life as a normal person, and that's kind of a problem because then you have these politicians who use fear mongering tactics and you know regular kind of human kind of sort of you know I mean ultimately marketing tactics to kind of get to to people right and 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 con convince them essentially of what they should be voting for. But, you know, like actually it's not really that fair because the other politicians are, you know, they actually are saying very good things and very reasonable um, things that actually would really affect people's lives in a positive way, but people don't really understand that. And I think uh, AI could be a really nice bridge um, between a lot of the kind of more esoteric information that people speak about um, and, um, and you know, the more regular person and kind of bridging, um, you know, the, the as Stacey's talking about, the, the kind of wisdom, um, really, it, it can, if you, if you get it right, it can kind of bridge the gap between why should I care and how will this affect me on a day-to-day -day basis? And, you know, this is the scientific rigorous, um, you know, well-defined economic or social policy and the budget distribution um, that we've chosen to do, right? And, and you know, th then you, you kind of have a nice, um, you empower a lot of people who may not have the education or the means or the interest really um, in, in, you know, voting or understanding those things. But at the end of the day, they care about what happens in their daily lives. So I, I'd say for me, that's that's one of the biggest um, uh, benefits. You won't have, you know, I probably shouldn't say so on here, but, you know, situations that would are not really ideal. Um, yeah, that's, that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Anika. So we will have some time for, you know, uh, expressing your conclusion or you know some any remark that you think will add will some you know some extra richness to this discussion so we'll start with you dr jang any concluding remarks to enrich this already rich discussion okay yeah i think this is a, a great discussion uh i really want to emphasize one uh item i think is a very important including ai ethics in school curriculums is very important for you know uh, a few reasons. Number one is the safety, because you know, AI can do a lot of things, but it can also you know create problems. So learning about the AI ethics can really help students uh, use it safely and responsibly. You know responsibly. 
Uh, the second item I want to mention is uh, equality. AI affects people and the society. Understanding the impacts help create systems that are fair and inclusive for everyone. So AI capability should be, you know, be used by everyone, not just, you know, used by a set of uh, people. Number three is laws. Many places have rules about using AI right now. So knowing uh, this kind of rules can help students follow them in you know, the future jobs or even the, in the projects. Uh, the last one is the values, because uh, learning AI ethics can really help student, students think uh, you know, critically about the, uh, what's right and what's wrong making better choices when you know creating ai related technologies uh, in short uh, you know the teaching ai ethics uh, in school you know can really help create responsible developers and ensure ai is used in a way that benefit everyone and benefit the society as a whole yeah thank you very much this is what i want to say Thank you so much for your insights. Stacy. I have a specific question for you. Um, you know, in light of the conclusion that you will make, um, since you were talking about humanistic psychology, how do you think AI can help us become, uh, I know it's, it's, it's a vague question, it's, it's too general, but how can it help us become individualized or, you know, aid in this process of, individuation or self-actualization, what do you think is the role of AI in that process? Mm, yeah, that is a big question. Um, yeah, maybe I'll answer it um, in kind of a pragmatic way, actually, because you've mentioned youth um, several times and, you know, Dr. Jang's talked about education and Annika, these issues around how do we, how do we sort of maintain our agency and educate ourselves. So, so this, this kind of leads to this question of how does, how do we interact with AI to make us more con to help us evolve, become more conscious, self-actualized, as you say. Um, and it's, it's, it, it, of course, not all of us have direct influence over how AI is being built, but we all have direct control over how we engage with AI. And so I would offer maybe a couple of suggestions in that realm to sort of maximize our sort of hopefully benevolent self-actualization curve, right? So the first, and these are pretty pragmatic, but the first is to really engage now. So start becoming an expert with the tools. I would suggest that young people and all of us get access to all the public LLMs, ChatGPT, Claude, Gemini, whatever you can, and to use them on a daily basis because you know, so to give them each the same prompt and see how they respond, see what each is good at, persist in perfecting your prompts and learning how to best kind of elicit from AI what you care about, learn how to use them to become an enhanced human, right? Um, and explore other AI applications and tools that are relevant alongside your work, your schoolwork, your hobbies. I think this experience will be highly valuable as things get more complex with distributed agents, right? That we will actually increasingly become managers of these teams of agents. And so what are your management skills? Like we'll all have AI assistants and tutors and helper experts and consultants. And it'll be really helpful to get comfort now with the individual agents right, as we transition into managing teams of distributive agents, just so that we feel a comfort level in how to use AI for our, for our highest benefit and flourishing. Okay, the second suggestion would be around um, valuing your attention and agency, right? You can't be self-actualized if you give your agency away and if you give your attention away unconsciously. And as we all know, technology is influencing us all the time. And we see that, you know, with social media, some of the precursors to what we'll see more intensely with AI, right? So it's, it's not just that AI isn't yet particularly wise, right? It's also often performing what my friend, Dr. Julia Mossbridge calls the cognitive heist, right? We all need to stay alert to the downsides of things like deadening our perception and relinquishing our agency and learned helplessness, 
right? I mean, as an example, people used to knew, know where they were in relation to things, but then with mapping software, you can just go on Google Maps and you never really have to know where you are or how you got there, right? It's a small thing, but these kinds of issues can amplify with AI. So good, the good news is simultaneously, right? Consumer level wisdom AI applications will come to the, on the scene. There'll be access to therapists and coaches and wisdom guides and self-reflection -re tools. And you know, most people will likely have a companion robot you know, in the future with wise agents that can be designed for things like you're mentioning mental health support and creativity and human connection and evolution. So for young people, and again, all of us, I, I would probably share what my sister-in-law says to my niece and nephew when they leave the house, which is make good choices, <laughs> you know, choose very wisely what apps you consume. Uh, and then third, I would say that intention really does matter. So you know, our, the way we approach AI may end up being one of the most important things as it relates to our, our experience of the ability to self-actualize using AI tools, right? There've been a number of early experiments suggesting that our intention and therefore also the prompts we write and how we write them, right? Make a difference in the experience with we have, that we have with AI and its responses. So, um, you know, in there's value in using Socratic approaches and humanistic approaches to drawing out the wisdom of both humans and AI in conversation, right? So I would like just recommend taking a moment when you approach AI and asking, hey, or saying, and here's how I'm feeling today. How are you? Right. I'm interested in discussing this difficult situation, but I want to work it out together. Can you be you know, a, a creative thought partner with me in thinking through this. And for the human operator, at the very least, this will feel better, right? And it may even get to better outcomes if we use our own empathy, intention, and self-care as a frame of reference as we interact with AI. So I guess those were some, those would be some practical ways I'd sort of coach us to move towards a more self-actualized experience with AI technology. Oh, wow, that's deep. Here is an open invitation to all of you to contribute articles to the upcoming issue of Cadmus Journal. So please do make a note of it. And uh, you know you know what journal is all about. It focuses on transdisciplinarity. So please, um, you're welcome to submit your article for consideration. Thank you so much. And um, Anika, so um, as for your concluding remark, I, I think I would like you to focus more on since you are a youth leader, how can AI as a tool amplify the voices of youth leaders and uh, you know prepare them to be active participants in shaping the future? What do you think? Yeah, you know, one of the things that that I think about a lot is um, I, I said this on the last panel I was on, and I'll say it again: ninety-seven percent of the world's data is locked up. Um, uh, you know, it's it, the data AIs require data in order to get smarter and um, you know understand more things um, and understand relationships between things, um, but. Today, because we've come from a past uh, history where, you know, data wasn't that important, it's kind of locked up in paper, it's, you know, locked up on random devices, um, it's not connected, it wasn't important. Um, it's very difficult to kind of go back in time and, and change that. But we, as, as a youth, we have an opportunity to change that. Um, we have an opportunity to actually keep the data that's structured um, to, you know, make sure it's connected together, it's accessible by AI, um, it's, it's usable. And um, we have the opportunity to unlock tons of uh, value um, with AI that, you know, today we actually can't really unlock uh, because we don't have the ability to access um, the information that's required in order to create less, less bias um, and, you know, less... Um, sort of uh, what I like to call propaganda. Um, 
we have a nice opportunity to look at wisdom or, or like Dr. Jang says, um, education. Um, it's, it's super important um, to be able to unbiasedly give, well, I mean, it's hard to say unbiasedly because everything's a little bit biased, but, you know, at least being able to share all of the different perspectives um, so that someone can, you know, interpret it then, themselves um, how they want. Um, yeah, it, I think that's super important. And we as a youth, it's our responsibility to build the pickaxe and shovel of the AI rush, which is data. Um, we need to build and, and provide the data that the AI needs in order to flourish. So I would say that's my my big kind of uh, point to youth, really. It's like, let's not make the same mistake as our predecessors. <laughs> and let's, um, you know, try and build a future where governments run on more technology. Um, you know, AI is seen more as a tool um, that's a bit different than a human anyway, um, but that adds value and um, yeah some other things like you know more fair voting more understanding that things are biased etc we can only do that with data so that's my thought thank you anika so um as we conclude this session i want to emphasize that you know again that the conversation doesn't stop here we've barely scratched the surface so to truly maintain this momentum and take things forward, we must continuously engage and co-create. And so thank you once again, all of you for your participation. And I really look forward to your continuous, continuous engagement. Thank you so much.